Yes, good morning all. This is uh, Malik Ishmael with the Vanguard Show on podcast. Today's May 9th, 2021, episode number 19. And the Vanguard Show has been sponsored by From Old Guard to Vanguard, book by Malik Ishmael, as well as the photo exhibit From Old Guard to Vanguard. Both have Facebook pages. And today I want to welcome a very special guest who I had the honor of uh, meeting uh, in London, uh, around 2019, if I'm uh, not mistaken. And uh, he is a, a professor, he's a writer, author, uh, and uh, like I say, he's a uh, Nigerian by birth and based in London, England. His name is Professor Adeyinka Makinde. Did I say that correctly, brother? Yeah, that's, that's very good. That's oh, okay. very nice. I need to anoint you as a uh... A member of the Yoruba nation now. Oh, okay. So I'm a, a treasured linguist now, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I want to give a little history of uh, Professor McKinde. He uh, is a trained, he's trained as a barrister and as a lecturer in law and in a number of uh, colleges and universities in the United Kingdom. He wrote the well-received book, Dick Tiger, The Life and Times of a Boxing Immortal, as well as the life and times, the life and mob slang rather of uh, Frankie De Paula. And he's also a contributor writer to the uh, Cambridge companion piece on boxing, which I, I actually have a copy of it right here. And I know that uh, your sections were not page 99 and 223, but uh, we definitely want to get into uh, your other writings and, uh, and things of that sort. And I want to, first of all, uh, say happy uh, Mother's Day to uh, uh, your mom. I do it my mom. My mom is, uh, is, uh, is going to be a heavenly birthday, but uh, I want to wish you and yours uh, definitely a happy Mother's Day. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. And then my first question is, uh, first of all, I want to first thank uh, Brother uh, Timba Sabeko uh, for uh, getting us together in London. And I had such a great time with you. How did you first meet uh, the Sebeko family? And, you know, and uh, how did you uh, come up with them? Well, that, that happened in London when we were children. Okay. The early 1970s. My father uh, was a Nigerian naval officer and he was posted there as a military attache at the Nigerian High Commission. You know, we lived in a suburb of London called uh, Hendon. Uh, uh, this, the, the name of the road was Hillview Gardens, and um, one of our neighbors was this family from South Africa, right. the Sibekos. Their father, David Sibeko, as you know, uh, I think you met their mother as well, yeah. um, and um, they, they were members of PAC, who are not as familiar as the ANC, the African National Congress. But uh, their father was uh, a representative of PAC, and we uh, lived in the same neighborhood. And we mm. all, um, you know, as kids do, we all uh, got to know each other. And uh, we lost touch. Actually, we lost touch uh, for for many years. And I, uh, I sort of reached out to Temba once. You know, once with the internet thing got going, email and searches and that sort of thing. I think in the early two thousands. And then later on, obviously, when the era of Facebook came in, we, we, we did get uh, to, uh, together again. But um, yes, uh, that's how it happened uh, many, many years ago. Oh, OK. All right. Yeah, I had a chance to meet uh, Bongani as well as uh, Mother uh, Elizabeth Sabeko uh, on a trip down to uh, South Africa. And I also got a chance to meet uh, uh, Benny Alexander, who was formerly known as uh, Cosan X, I believe, uh, if I'm saying it correctly. Uh, he was the Secretary General of the pan Africanist Congress when we were doing some uh, organizational uh, uh, things uh, down there. So uh, the Sebeko family is very, very uh, uh, cherished to me. And uh, I want to thank uh, Timba for, for, I hope I'm saying his name right. Is it Timba or Timba? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not South Africa, but it, it, should, it should be Timba. Timba, Timba okay, think, right, yeah. right. Well, big shout out to uh, Timba. So uh, much appreciated for the uh, introduction. Uh, first of all, how have you been since uh, the uh, pandemic, uh, the lockdown, uh, and, and what is life like in London right now? Well, I think, uh, well, they're just trying to come out of a lockdown at the moment. Okay. And uh, so it's been more or less the same as it has been uh, for much of the world um, in terms of um, 
governments uh, decreeing almost. I mean, they would uh, pass an, a law to do it, but it, it does seem uh, uh, like, like a decree, a draconian action to, you know, tell people um, stay indoors, don't communicate, work from home. So that's what's been happening, really. Um, you know, going to the shop, wearing masks and, um, you know, working remotely uh, from home. So um, things are easing up now. Okay. Um, and um, that, that really is, you know, that, that really is the scene. Um, how is it over there with you? Uh, it's the same thing. They're opening up and now they're starting to kind of fall back from that because of, uh, I guess, a spike. Uh, throughout the, uh, the the nation, so uh, it's going to get harder to kind of figure out this uh, pandemic, as I call it. But uh, <laughs> so it is what yes. it is. <laughs> I think we need to obviously scrutinize what governments do. I mean, I think uh, in today's world it's always ca characterized by this uh, tendency to polarity. Yes. You know, this uh, tendency to culture wars or ideological uh, polarity. It's either you're with us or you're not without us. Right. You know, you're either red pilled or not. Right, right. In the you're matrix. either <laughs> right on or you're the devil. Right. And that 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 goes for right. left and right uh, in the political spectrum. I think it's ridiculous. I think first of all, the p Corona pandemic has given a lot of leeway for corruption to ensue mm, from yeah. uh, members of government and the lobbies that control them. And Big Pharma, of which uh, Pfizer is, uh, is a part of, yes. it, you know, um, are heavily into this. And I, so I don't think it's right for uh, people who deviate from the mainstream uh, view of things to be as, uh, demonized as, as, as such. There's a whole spectrum of views out there. But one thing that is definitely clear right from the beginning of of the uh declared global crisis was um insider trading you know mm -hmm. u.s politicians selling stocks because they knew what was going to happen exactly and then the kind of the political football mm -hmm. vice president now kamala harris saying uh, she wouldn't accept uh, a vaccine uh through donald trump's presidency but now that she's in power she's changed her tune um, I think, you know, and, and Pfizer, uh, for instance, is one of the big pharma companies. Uh, they, they are, uh, they've, in the past, they've exhibited uh, quite a lot of um, uh, bad tendencies. In, in many ways, they've already been uh, found out to be a criminal organization because they're the recipients of the highest ever fine in U.S. Uh, pharmaceutical history. Um, they were involved in uh, a, a set of botched trials in Nigeria, in the northern city of Kano, uh, which cost the lives of uh, several children and others uh, who were uh, physically disabled, you know, with uh, uh, um, conditions such as deafness. Mm -hmm. And they've also been strong ar arming governments who uh, don't want to accede to their terms, you know, uh, in Latin America, the governments of Brazil and Argentina. Uh, you know, Pfizer was saying, look, we need guarantees if, if people are going to sue us, if anything goes wrong with this quote unquote vaccine, uh, what we're going to do is um, we want guarantees uh, that we will not be sued. And part of that guarantee is that you will show the, the burden and we will also like uh, uh, think uh, government assets, <laughs> you know, like Federal right. Reserve uh, uh, buildings and trusts and um, also military bases as collateral. Right. So that's the level that you're dealing with, pure sheer gangsterism. Mm. And I don't believe I'm being sensationalist in saying that. So I would advise everybody, yes, as the, uh, the, the uh, government health agencies uh, do say, um, don't um, fall for rumors. Do your research, and uh, if you do your research, you will find out that um, um, a lot of interesting facts. And uh, they're pushing this vaccine, quote unquote, on people, which went through, uh, didn't go through uh, a full set of trials, as usually occurs. There's right. no guarantee, as the websites of um, the governments, uh, the CDC in America and other places uh, show that um, it actually prevents people from catching 
uh, or, or, or you know being a recipient of, of a virus or passing it on. So one isn't uh, sort of saying that uh, you shouldn't go according to guidelines of basic safety, uh, particularly in regard to people who are definitely vulnerable mm. uh, to susceptible to this. Uh, but we've got to be very, very cautious because uh, Pfizer have, have been criminalized for actually mark, uh, um, uh, you know, for the, in the way they've marketed a, a drug in the past. They've also... Um, uh, uh, you know, they've been, they were also fined. Part of that fine by the, uh, the U.S. Uh, system was also to do with the fact that um, they had been coercing doctors. Hmm. So we need to be clear that if somebody tells us, uh, oh, you can't argue with science, well, hang on. Um, the science says that there's a high recovery rate for this virus. But other than that, um, you know, there are dissenters in science and a lot of these doctors and scientists, research scientists are afraid of losing their jobs if they deviate right. uh, from the party line, so to speak. So that's what I'm saying. Always be very, very critical about uh, these sorts of things and don't don't take things for granted. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was about to say, what is your uh, opinion of the response of Cuba, which uh, during global crisis, particularly in the medical uh, field, and despite the fact that they had this tyrannical draconian uh, embargo uh, leveled against them, uh, they've been able to address it in a certain way. Have you had a chance to kind of see how what Cuba has done in that regard? Yes, I've been aware that they formed these um, groups of parties that have been very helpful. In, uh, and um, if we put the the COVID, the, the uh, COVID and this uh, declared global crisis to one side, you know, I mean, the Cuban uh, health system has a, a very uh, good reputation um, world, worldwide. Um, that's not to wholeheartedly endorse everything about uh, the Cuban right. uh, administration, right. but it's uh, certainly the embargo imposed on them um, is, is totally inhuman. Um, and uh, shouldn't have happened. Um, but I, I also have my criticisms of, uh, uh, you know, the Cuban uh, um, attitude uh, to this uh, cleared crisis and, and as well in Russia, because mm -hmm. it, they are joining in this global market mm -hmm. of pushing these vaccines. My fear is, you know, so they want money, they want foreign currency, they want national prestige. So nobody's above suspicion, nobody's above critique. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm looking at Cuba, I'm looking at the Western states, I'm looking at uh, Russia, um, also looking at uh, you know, the African nations and how they're, they're all handling this. You, you may have heard of the death of the Tanzanian president. Yes, yes. Uh, a couple of months ago, who, who um, was skeptical about COVID and there, there haven't been that much of a lockdown there. I mean, perhaps the circumstances in Africa are certainly different, but I would always just highlight the fact that this is a very highly recoverable um, um, vi a virus. And um, we should just always bear that in mind. Okay. Very and careful I about what governments tell us. Right, right. That's true. And, and uh, I do want to kind of say on a personal note, I had such a great time when you took us to uh, Brixton, uh, my wife and I, uh, we, we had such a great time. I know we were looking for this Caribbean restaurant, <laughs> which I was yeah. never able to find. But tell me, uh, you know, because I've always had a high regard for Brixton. Could you give people a, a inkling on what Brixton means to uh, people of African descent and, and, and Caribbean descent in, uh, in England? Well, I suppose after the post-war uh, emigration to uh, Britain from parts of the Caribbean, um, Brixton was one of those parts of London that were settled into by um, people of Afro-Caribbean origin. Um, and I think um, from there, it, it developed as this... Uh, I, I don't know, a, a lightning rod, or, or, you know, some, a place that sort of represented uh, the experience, the, the overall experience of mm -hmm. Blacks in um, uh, Britain from the Caribbean. Um, that, you know, for, 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 you know, the whole spectrum of, uh, the, you know, the good, the bad, mm -hmm. and the ugly. 
you know, racism, achievements. Um, I think um, you, you may be obviously familiar. There were the Brixton riots in the early yeah. 1980s. Yes. And then true. we, and then we had the, uh, there was something called the Scarman Report. Um, and a lot of the, what caused the Brixton riots, part of that, apart from, um, you know, the usual tensions and the cultural issues in, involved with policing was uh, an act of parliament called the SUS laws, mm. you know, SUS, sh short for suspicion, you know, and uh, it was a draconian way in which you could, um, you could sort of uh, stop people and really question them and arrest them without the usual uh, legal requirement of, you know, reasonable suspicion, that sort of thing. Right. I think the laws that were governing that were invented to cover vagrants. And uh, many of those uh, people were, were Irish people who were escaping the potato famine. And so they were, sus laws were used against them. And um, it was sort of um, used against the Afro-Caribbean um, uh, emig immigrants uh, who came in the post-war period. So yes, in terms of culture, uh, black businesses, uh, that sort of thing, and the negative aspects uh, as well, um, gangster, uh, that sort of thing. It's well, all I, there. No, I was about to say, I did have the pleasure of uh, interviewing Alex Weedle. Uh, you know, he's a, uh, a uh, well-known uh, novelist. Uh, it was, it was uh, a few episodes ago, but he kind of, you know, laid it out within his uh, books. Uh, have you ever, uh, you know, kind of read his books and kind of, you know, thought about maybe uh, uh, doing a, uh, maybe making a, uh, writing a book about Brixton or, or that really is not uh, in your genre? No, I, I, I don't know of the gentleman. I haven't read. Okay. Okay. Um, as for, as for <laughs> For reading uh, or, or writing a book on Brixton, I haven't, I haven't thought, I haven't really thought about that. It, it really needs to be a unique angle, right, uh, to capture, to capture my attention there. Oh, okay. Other, th other than that, you, you want to know about the history of Brixton, particularly the era I was referring to. Then you just, just listen to Eddie Grant. Oh you know? yeah. <laughs> you, you <laughs> told me you were, you, you were hearing all these sounds from the UK early eighties <laughs> MTV boy that you were. And, you know, living on the front line, that was sort of late 70s. And then he did right. Electric Avenue, which is a famous road on uh, in, in Brixton. You uh, you and I stood right there at Electric Avenue. And and, uh, and certainly my viewers, I'll let you, I was just ex so excited to be standing on Electric Avenue <laughs> in Brixton. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of books, I want to get into your, your uh, books, uh, the... Um, Dick Tracy, The Life and Times of a Boxing Immortal. Dick Tiger. And Dick Tiger, I'm sorry. Dick Tiger, The Life and Times of a Boxing Immortal, as well as Jersey Boy, The Life and Mob Slaying of Frankie DePaula. Could you uh, talk about each of those books and what inspired you to write them? Well, first of all, uh, the Dick Tiger book, um, I think uh, he, 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 he was a... Uh, uh, a boxer famous in his time mm -hmm. and a national hero in a newly independent Nigeria at the time. And um, I grew up uh, hearing about him, but he died at an early age, you know, just after his career had ended. And so the other Nigerian uh, boxer who became a world champion, the first uh, world champion from Nigeria, Hogan Kid Bassley, he was still alive and uh, uh, involved in amateur boxing. So we, we knew about him, but Dick Tiger, knew next to nothing about him. But I heard all these snippets uh, when I was growing up, you know, that he he was a supporter of the secessionist movement of Biafra, mm -hmm. and he joined the army there, and he was this world champion boxer. And um, I remember in the 80s, I saw this uh, photograph, which I'd never seen before, of Tiger in his uh, army fatigues. Mm -hmm. uh, he joined the propaganda division of the, of the Biafra, and, um, machinery of the secession instead of Biafra. They wanted to break away from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. I was very struck by it and that really got my interest, but it took another sort of 10 years before I then put pen to paper okay. and felt, look, this is a very, very important story to write about. I enjoy history and uh, not just of the country from which I originate from, but uh, all types of history. But, uh, you know, the civil war is a very pivotal area. I've always enjoyed boxing and the history 
of boxing. I consider myself a student of, 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 of boxing history. And um, so I thought, look, just in the way that you've had these uh, monumental dedications to great boxers like uh, Sugar Ray Robinson, mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali, Joe Lewis. Let's have one of Dick Tiger, Richard Ihetu was his real name because uh, nobody had ever written a book about that. And so the thing uh, about it also was that, you know, when you're writing a book um, and certainly with a character as intriguing as um, Richard Ihetu, otherwise known as Dick Tiger, is the surrounding circumstances, you know, the society he grew up in with, the, the, the political circumstances and how he intersected with boxing history because mm. he was born uh, to the Igbo people who uh, come from the southeastern part of, of Nigeria. And they, you know, the, unlike uh, their neighbors in, from the Benin Empire and the empires of Oyo, the Hausa Fulani, they didn't uh, develop a sort of a feudal hierarchical systems. But they, uh, after colonization, they rapidly became educated. And certainly uh, the city that Dick Tiger migrated to as a young man, Abba, was one which kind of encapsulated that whole zeitgeist, the whole spirit mm -hmm. of entrepreneurship, of uh, belief in God and hard work and probity. So Dick Tiger was a part of that. And I enjoyed looking at that. I enjoyed looking at the origins of Nigerian boxing, which has inspired uh, more than one person, one academic uh, from, uh, he was Canadian, and did his doctorate at the University of um, Florida. Um, he used that book as, as a template for development on his uh, uh, thesis. Okay. So, um, and then coming to Britain, that was in the, you know, I just referred to you, the migration of people from the African Caribbean uh, um, islands in, um, you know, the post-war period. They passed the British Nationality Act, which gave citizenship uh, to people in the empire, as it then was, and they were invited to run the health service, etc. Well, accompanying that migration was also sportsmen, boxers. And so Dick Tiger joined that migration and he went to Liverpool, a city within Britain, which has a long legacy of, uh, you know, a black population there. So that was yet another angle. And then Dick Tiger went to America in the hope to conquer America, which he did in New York City. And so he was one of the last boxers in the heyday of Madison Square Garden. You know, he was a foreigner. And I think at that time, boxing was becoming more internationalized. You know, you had Benny Kid Perret uh, from Cuba. You had Emil Griffith on the Virgin Islands. They both had that tragic match yes. in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. And so Dick Tiger, he came from Nigeria via Britain. So he was also part of that uh, environment. And then, of course, there was the Nigerian Civil War. Right. Uh, he was a national hero, uh, uh, fought a big fight uh, in uh, a city of the city of Ibadan in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Ibadan, let me well, okay, pronounce right. that properly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and... Um, uh, so he was a national hero, uh, but um, then the Civil War came and he felt, uh, you know, the Igbo people of uh, the former eastern region of Nigeria were the majority of people who decided they wanted to split away from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And Dick Tiger felt he had no choice but to join that uh, struggle. And so therefore his prestige in, America, in Nigeria mm -hmm. went down. And that's part of the reason for writing the book, because, okay. you know, he, he was written out of history, basically, uh, uh, because of what he believed in. Uh, the Biafran uh, bid for secession ended in disaster. And, um, of course, there was a, 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 a spirit of unity, no victim, no vanquished. Uh, but he wasn't rehabilitated. A number of people were rehabilitated, but... Uh, uh, those were people who maybe were caught up in the war as such, but he was a, a man with a name behind him. And um, he uh, and that was unforgivable to those in the military government in Nigeria. So I hope, uh, yeah, what I did in writing his book, including all these themes in it, yeah. uh, not just simple uh, A to B, uh, one, two, three, uh, basic biography, but something that did justice to his uh, circumstances and the whole social-political 
uh, uh, and also the boxing history surrounding his life would all be shown out to show what an extraordinary person he is. The other book I wrote uh, about Frankie de Paula yes. was an offshoot of that because oh, okay. uh, in the age of the internet, you know, I was I, I sort of uh, put in some stuff uh, on the web, World Wide Web, and the son of this uh, Amer uh, Italian American fighter named Frankie de Paula got in touch with me because you know I sort of uh, put a special place in a fight that this man had with Dick Tiger at Madison Square Garden. It was a rough and tumble fight. Okay. Uh, it earned uh, the Ring Magazine Fighter of the Year Award for wow. 1968. <laughs> and so, and, and then I, as I, you know, and I was a bit reluctant, obviously. Who is this man? You know, this is a, a club fighter. I had heard of him and he got rubbed out to use the, <laughs> to okay. use the language of the, right. You know, by the, the by the Cosa Nostra, mm -hmm. uh, very early age, thirty one years of age. Why would I want to write about it? But I did look at that into it, and I found he also led a fascinating life because this uh, was a man who he came from hum humble origins, but he was a very charismatic man who unfortunately was waylaid uh, by the uh, you know the leer of um, money and. Um, other distracting pursuits, which took away from his uh, ability to make himself into a, a, a great fighter. Okay. Um, and, yeah. um, you know, so it, it involved me researching the history of um, Jersey City, a very fascinating, right. very fascinating uh, place, because everybody knows about New York. You grow up, right. you know, without Google Earth, and I don't even know <laughs> Google Earth that much, but if you grow up, you watch Starsky and Hodge, Kojak, right. Right. You watch these different movies. You you know where the Empire State Building is. You know where Lower Manhattan is, almost by osmosis. You don't right. need to do any research. But True. Jersey City was, yeah, just across the Hudson River. Smaller place, but um, quite a fascinating place. Mm. You know, a place, you know, mainly Roman Catholic, a place where the, the big... Uh, barons you know the non-wasp those who were not white anglo-saxon protestants you know the roman catholic irish who right. were below the pecking order mm. uh you know there was this ethnic uh, kind of divide intra-ethnic divide which is kind of forgotten in these days where right. people are white and they're black yeah, yeah. but they forget that uh, so anyway um you had uh haig uh, this man who was a, quite a, an extraordinary big boss of jersey city and the corruption that permeated that place. And um, so that kind of sets the scene for Frankie de Paula because he was, a, he, he, you know, he, he was a man who knew Frankie Valley, you know, the famous oh, yeah, singer. And, and when, singer, he, right. you know, when he did um, get into, um, he did, you know, he got into what Madison Square Garden, he had this big following, club following surrounding him. And remember, this is the time I was talking about the immigrants in boxing, mm -hmm. like Emil Griffith and uh, Benny Kidd Parrot. And, and so the Irish, uh, the Italians, uh, Jewish boxers who dominated boxing in the 1930s, they diminished and the, the black right. boxer had risen by now. So Frankie de Paula, a man with knockout power, in the post era of Marciano and people like that, you know, it was obvious that he would have this sort of attention. And um, he developed him, you know, he, he didn't really develop his talents, but he did get to Madison Square Garden, courtesy of the mob who okay. were backing him. Right. And I think his life is a study of um, how, you know, the, the, uh, you know, it's a cautionary tale of how things can go haywire because um, he, he, apart from knowing people like Frankie Valley, uh, the other sort of people who were attracted to him were like Joe Namath, mm -hmm. the uh, American football legend. Right, yes. um, Frank Sinatra was ringside um, and a lot of famous uh, uh, American Italian singers. So very charismatic man. And so that was what intrigued me about it. The dimension obviously of, his promise as a fighter, but also of his destruction, which was born out of personal weakness and uh, allowing himself to be exploited, uh, uh, certainly in this case, by the American mafia. Wow. Well, there's, it's such a fascinating story in both those uh, books. Uh, but I'd like to, uh, well, first of all, where can people get your, your uh, those books, copies of those books? Go to Amazon.com. Okay. Well, you know, go to eBay. I think uh, certainly the the Jersey Boy book is has been in you know supply 
Okay. Uh, Dick Tiger, it's kind of out of, that's out of uh, print, but you can still get copies of it if you search. Okay. We'll, we'll try and, uh, uh, my attention has been deviated a, a couple of times, you know, because ideally I'd obviously want the Dick Tiger story to be told in a, in a fabulous, uh, you know, uh, high production value documentary, if not a movie, right. just like Jersey Boy. Would be. And I've had some interest here and there, but uh, all through the years, nothing has come about. So fingers crossed. Okay, uh, all right. Yes. Both, both of them should indeed make uh, for great uh, films. Um, and um, yeah, we'll, um, yeah. Yeah, and, we'll, we'll look, look into that. Okay, well, what I was going to also ask about is uh, talking about fantastic, your YouTube channel. I mean, from Nigerian uh, military history, boxing, even with the Black Panther movement on both sides of the Atlantic. Tell us about your YouTube channel, which I, I just think is fantastic. <laughs> well, thanks for saying that. I think we, we're over almost 55,000 uh, subscribers. Wow. Okay, That wasn't my intention. It just grew out of something I, I, I enjoy doing. Um, I was making a lot of playlists uh, for, for uh, uh, newsreels from Nigerian history. Mm -hmm. And um, it just kind of developed from there. Uh, people began, because I just did it for a, just a personal, uh, just for my personal delectation, my personal knowledge and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Everybody, I, it, it seems a lot of people starved about history. And mm -hmm. so I do that. And I also make posts of historical events in uh, the community section of the channel. So we, we, you know, we cover quite a lot in African history, you know, uh, things to do with the liberation movements of Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. And we have some old Rhodesians there. Right, okay. Still pained about right. uh, <laughs> having <laughs> okay. white minority government uh, lost and, uh, you know, and then Nigerian, Ghanaian history, that was the dominating factor there. But, you know, we spread things out and uh, we have the good, the bad and the ugly. We've got Mr. Idi Amin, um, and uh, all sorts of uh, things there. So it's just great. I, I love history. I enjoy history. Yeah. And um, it's just a great way to interact um, with, with the globe because uh, it really does have a, a global reach. You know, we've got, uh, uh, you know, people from Singapore, Malaysia, for instance, because I posted some uh, newsreels on uh, Lee Kuan Yew. Okay. The uh, famous uh, pride, I think he is anyway, of... Uh, um, nation builder of uh, Singapore. And, uh, so yeah, we, that's what it's all about. So co come, come and enjoy. Okay. And how, how would they do that? Uh, how do you, uh, how do people look up your uh, YouTube channel? Um, well, you just, uh, you can search for my name. Um, but um, yeah, Ade Yinka Makinde. It just goes by my name. Maybe I should just turn into Ade Yinka's history. Right. Channel, but <laughs> it just started as a, as a personal thing, you know. Okay. Um, looking at my own personal interests, yeah. Well, for, for the audience purposes, go ahead and spell out your first name and last name so they can go ahead and look it up on YouTube, if you don't mind. Yeah, my name is full name. My first name, Adeyinka, uh, A-D-E-Y-I-N-K-A. And my surname is Makinde, M-A-K-I-N-D-E. Do you want to tell me, brother, or should, do you want me to tell the audience, brother, what it means, what my names mean? Please. <laughs> <laughs> Ade Yinka means crowns surround me. Ade is mm. crown, yeah? Yimika, so to surround, yeah? So crowns surround me. My Beautiful. name, my surname, Makinde, uh, is Muakinde, bring, bring home the valiant man, bring home the valiant mm. warrior. Mm. Now, is this Igbo uh, meaning? Yoruba. Yoruba. Yeah, okay. You, okay. Yoruba. As we said right at the beginning. That's right. That's right. That's right. My, my memory yeah. goes pretty fast. <laughs> yeah. A lot of Yoruba over there in uh, America, Yoruba culture, so, uh, the southern part of the uh, United States. Wow. And uh, there's, I think there's a, a famous town or uh, uh, Yoruba town, is it uh, based on Oyo? They're you know, developed by African uh, American people. Okay. And of course, Yoruba culture is there in the Caribbean, okay. uh, very strong there. And obviously in Latin America, Brazil, Pantombele, right. the, that religion, religion right. from uh, the Ifa and uh, you know, the uh, methods of uh, worship among the Yoruba. 
Okay. Yes. Wow, that's some great history there. And uh, my uh, next question is, the, discuss the differences between the British Black Panther Party and the American Black Panther Party, uh, what the differences were, and and uh, had the international section been able to maintain uh, uh, without the uh, split, what would have developed? So just give me a history if you don't mind. Yeah, that, you've, you've got me on that one, uh, Malik. You've got me on that because I haven't really done a lot of research on the uh, Black Panther Party in, the, in Britain, in the UK. Okay. You brought that, you reminded me about it because I remember there was a guy who became a famous um, uh, news, well, not a news person, but a media figure, uh, le the late Darkest Howe. Oh, yes, yes, who, yes. You know, uh, I, I, and I had that uh, kind of knowledge, but at the end of the day, the, the intriguing things, I know more about the American uh, Black Panther Party than, than the UK one. Of course, I was well aware about, uh, you know, various facets of um, Black, uh, the black struggle in, in Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of that wasn't, it wasn't sort of focused on the Black Panthers. Um, there were all these sorts of uh, groups, community groups, uh, for instance, uh, uh, to do with things like police brutality and, and, and the like. Um, black Panther Party, look, it's, um, it, it's, it's, it took root in, in, in various ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that, um, even the idea of the Black Panther Party, it went beyond uh, Britain and America because you had a Black Panther Party in Israel. Yes. Among right. those, uh, in di well, uh, the, um, the these were the Arab uh, sort of those Jews who came from the Arab nations mm. and who felt discriminated by the European uh, Ashkenazis. Right. And they actually uh, adopted, you know, the Black Panther uh, the, uh, um, symbol. Mm -hmm. um, so Black Panther, it's all about, I would, I, would, I would speak less about what's different between them and, and more about what's similar about them, including that one that materialized in Israel of all places. And it's really just about resistance. Yes, you know? yes. I think it had a left, uh, a left wing view to things, a Marxist view often, um, but um, it, and there's that aspect of protest and uh, radicalization of, 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 of people. Um, it's interesting you mentioned that. It, it just brought to my attention when I started living, I, I lived in Britain and Nigeria at different points of my life. And, but I did come at a time to live in Britain when I was sort of, that, you'd call that junior high school uh, time. And I, one of the, uh, the, the uh, teachers, uh, this uh, English man, uh, he gave me, because he knew about my interest in all sorts of things, he actually recommended Soul Dad Brother to oh, me, George, about, Jackson. Uh, yeah. George Jackson. Yeah. So I was I was reading a lot about that, but I didn't sort of keep, uh, uh, keep, keep, keep it up. Um, but yeah, I would, I, 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 the, the Black Panther Party in Britain were not as important as yeah. Black Panther if we want to look at things in a social uh you know uh, you know a sociological way or a historical way um they were one facet of black consciousness and black resistance in the united kingdom uh, among uh, this at the time new immigrant communities from uh, you know from um, the caribbean mainly um whereas in america uh, that was an evolution in Black American consciousness. You know, Black American consciousness has had those two uh, things, integrate or nationalism. Right. And so you can just go back to the days of Nat Turner and the slaves Muslims. who wanted to yeah. find a, mm -hmm. uh, a, their, a land of their own, uh, run away from Massa, Bossa, Whitey, right. and form, <laughs> for, <laughs> form their own states and their own self-determination. And you trace that route to uh, Moorish um, uh, Noble Drew Ali, yeah. uh, Marcus Garvey, Nation, Nation of, of Islam. Islam. And I yeah. think, you know, um, the Black Panther Party was kind of coming from that direction, although they had the ideological, uh, not the religious thing. And I think obviously also like a, a link between uh, um, Malcolm X, when he renounced the Nation of Islam, mm -hmm. 
he maintained he was still a, a Muslim, but he was going to focus on the nationalist aspect. Right. So I think, you know, uh, and Stokely Mike, uh, Carmichael coming up there, I think the Black Panthers were kind of situated as, a, a, as an evolution from that um, aspect. So, yeah, very, very, uh, very, very uh, important. And, um, yeah, I've been very interested um in that uh, and i think historically the thing the way to look about at these sort of things like the black panthers is is really not necessarily to talk about them as uh, something that necessarily still needs to be around today i hope i'm not being controversial with you uh, alec here mm -hmm. is that you must always be evolving right, right so it's very very important to know about the past just like pan-africanism and dr Nkrumah yeah. or negritude and the sorts of people in, uh, who were associated with that, the writers and politicians like Sedar Seng of Senegal, but that things have to evolve. Right. And certainly when it comes to black uh, emancipation, black consciousness, that while the perception of blacks in the interaction in the Western world, in the, uh, the, black, the, you know, the Atlantic being brought there, slaves is, uh, is very important. It's also important at the same time not to be purely fixated on blackness, you right. know, in the sense that black is the be all and the, you know, the end all of your worldview. Right. That you cannot have room for learning about other things. You know, oh, I don't want to know about uh, what happened in Chile. I don't want to know about uh, uh, what happens in uh, the history of Asia. Right. You need the overall knowledge. You know, to be, uh, you know, a, a functioning, uh, enlightened person who can then uh, use that to develop uh, yourself and develop your your community. So, um, yeah, that's 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 the way I look at it. I mean, we can't go back in time in Africa and we know Prime Nkrumah did his best to raise the profile of Africans and, and Ghanaians. Right. Uh, people uh, either revere Nkrumah, they say there's a saying, Nkrumah can never do wrong. Right. Or people say, oh, he's a dictator. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was actually, a lot of you find at the end of it, it's all due to not just ideological stuff, but things to do with the uh, people's ethnic background. Right. Uh, I, but I think that Pan-Africanism is something that is not the whole, there is much more that people could do to develop new schools of thought that can inform people as we go along. That's very difficult. It's very difficult. You can't maintain separateness in an interconnected world right. or now that blacks are technically integrated into America, yeah. but um, you, 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 you can certainly adapt it and try and change the culture right. uh, for the better, always. Right. Because uh, Malcolm X is supposed to have said one time that black one day uh, black culture would be the dominant thing in America, which in a way has come to pass. Right. But if it's black culture is delimited just to gangster rap and uh, young women, you know, bearing their you know their you know, essentials, etc., and that's what people aspire to, and people are only materialistic about things. Uh, that is that is not the way forward, I would say. Right. So know your past, know your past, but let's develop on it. Well, one subject you covered uh, in uh, on your page and some of your writings was that evolution. You know how there are many positive aspects to the uh, Black Panther Party, but eventually, uh, I think you coined the term from Panthers to uh, pimps. Uh, talk about that uh, that you uh, enumerated, please. <laughs> I could get very controversial with this one um, because the big fear, uh, you know, like looking at the Black Lives Matter movement is this mentality, this complex that black justice for black people, the, the, you know, uh, ed, you know um, uh, advancement can come from one movement or one charismatic leader. No, no, um, I, I firmly believe Yes, there is a value to the Black Lives uh, Movement, but I believe ultimately that they are a proxy for the interests of other people. Right. And that Black people have to pull back 
and know yeah. when they're being used. And I think that's part of what happened with the Black Panther Party. Of course, the Black Panthers were infiltrated, right. you know, during the coin, Cointel Pro period. And J. Edgar Hoover and his successors were determined to smash it. And I think the Black Panther Party is a salutary note about taking up arms against the state. Because the state, even in America, can bear the overtones of a fascist state. You know, Adolf Hitler, when he right. executed his rivals within the Nazi party and consolidated his power as, uh, as the chancellor in something called the Night of the Long Knives, he right. said, uh, look, if anybody raises his hand against the state, then death will be his lot. And that was what happened with the Panthers. The Panthers did so much good, uh, you know, making breakfast uh, and food allocations for deprived uh, people. This is what people forget about it. Mm -hmm. But the element of radicalism, of uh, Huey Newton sitting in was it a rattan chair with a gun and, and, and things like that. And that scared the establishment, but they have a monopoly of arms. Yes. So... They were, you know, they determined to um, destroy the Panthers and they, and, and they did that. And part of the fault of that was also this overemphasis on if you're black, I trust you. If you're mm. white, I don't trust you. That was part of their downfall. And this is where the Panthers, the pimps thing comes, part of it comes into it with um, Gordon Parks mm. sort of, although his widow denies it, he was essentially an agent. Okay. You know, he was, he, was an, he was an agent of uh, Henry Lewis, the man who worked for Time Life and the, the American agencies. And, you know, when he was taking all these lovely photographs, you know, the Nation of Islam and uh, Black Panthers, he was giving information mm -hmm. to the government. He could not have done that if the, the Panthers didn't let their guard down, right. you know. Because he'd visit them in Algeria and, uh, you know, present, uh, you know, uh, nice photographs and nice story. But also he'd, he'd tell his handlers, oh, by the way, there's this escape hatch or this is what this uh, abode looks like, mm. you know. So, but I hope I'm not deviating too much. But oh, the no, main no. thing about that is that mm. in the late uh, 60s, um, the idea of uh, the Black revolutionary was just too much for the establishment to take. And so therefore what they wanted was to pacify that. Mm. So again, uh, the, the idea was uh, Gordon Parks went to Hollywood. They gave him money, budget to shoot a, a movie called Superfly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, Curtis Mayfield wrote the, the the soundtrack for that. I love Curtis Mayfield. Legendary. He was a <laughs> conscious man, and he was uh, he loved his people, and he was also critical mm. of his people at the same time. So it's a shame that his music would be associated with what eventually became a kind of a template mm. for the role model. You're no longer a revolutionary, which was kind of an extreme thing. Not all of us can be brave and stick our necks out in a right. certain way. You know, whether Huey and the Eldridge Cleaver went this way or that way, they had their flaws like everybody else. Yeah. But that was a process that we everybody had to go through. You, you need people like that. But, um, uh, but, but, but from that, it came the, the other extreme, right. you know, right. the pimp. Yeah. So if you're, you know, and the black exploitation movies then became the rage. So if you're just having uh, these cool looking guys, quote unquote, dressed to the nines right. with their uh, women working for them and right. uh, yeah. riding in Cadillacs and stuff like that, um, you're sending out a message there that this is the ideal. Mm. So people are not striving for education, attainment. Oh, that's too boring. Right. That's too hard. Ah, oh, that's stupid. You wouldn't earn big money. You know, you'd be like Superfly, be a pimp or be a drug dealer and you can make it big like them. And I think that was the beginning. It's certainly a, of the end of um, a lot of uh, advancement in black thinking because the youth were colonized. Their minds were colonized by this uh, terrible, uh, uh, you know, um, role model i mean it's the same like gangster rap people can talk about how oh it's about uh oh it just reflect in life no 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 who are the people who are the owners of the record companies that are enabling 
people to denigrate themselves, mm -hmm. you know, using the word nigger yeah. uh, as a popular term, uh, m meaning that uh, the other races will see you and think they can use it against you, right? Uh, you know, or use it with you in a supposedly friendly way. It becomes part of popular culture. Exactly. Know. And so this is where Malcolm's prediction was correct, but it's not going in the right way. And it's now time for people to think about ways in which, you know, the agencies of socialization can take young people away from that kind of thinking. But it was, it, it, it was a bad move, uh, you know, it, it was a bad development. Uh, just this proliferation of the, this uh, uh, images of the pimp as a stereotype. And so what do you have? Drug dependency, welfare dependency, um, you know, a lump of proletariat, uh, people who are not achieving what was supposed to be the ideal. Right. Whether you look at it from the extreme of the nation of Islam or the Garveyites through black nationalism, or the integrationists uh, following Martin Luther King, uh, this uh, cultural uh, interlude really uh, only succeeded in messing up the values of uh, black America. And it's time to, to get away from that. You know, it's time to get away from that. It's, you know, you can't, um, I know Cosby, uh, you, know, he, 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 you know, he was exposed later on uh, uh, and he's been convicted for that. He used, he used certain words which he was criticized for, but I don't think he was totally wrong. Okay. And just because we've discovered what a kind of a man he truly was, shouldn't detract from what he was trying to say right. there, a hypocrite that he may appear to people. And that's the way black America, I would say, uh, should, should, should go. You know, you look back at the ideas that inform people like Huey Newton and the Black Panthers. You look at even the Nation of Islam. Yeah. You don't have to accept the Nation yeah. of Islam's thesis and Dr. Yaqub or, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the go full circle with the integrationist mentality of uh, uh, what the civil rights movement was supposed to promise black people, which meant that, uh, you know, there was a breakup of uh, certain financial um, developed things that developed on the segregation, you know, black businesses, a lot of that was lost mm -hmm. uh, with integration. So th th there are ways in which people should look back in history and then think about how they can change things. Because I think it's, it's, it's the culture of, of things. The unfortunate thing is you still have that sort of mentality. You know, you're either with us, or you're a good. hard, you know, nigger, yeah. Yeah? yeah? Or you're not the charm. I know that word isn't often used, you know, Right, you know, handkerchief right. head, Uncle Tom, you know. But right. if you are just opting for this materialistic, nihilistic, you know, gangster lifestyle, if those are your role models mm -hmm. or these rappers uh, or these uh, young women who just have uh, inserts into their booties and mm -hmm. that, that's, 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 that's not the stellar thing. People should be thinking about education. Yeah, people should be thinking about entrepreneurship and um, putting their skin putting their skills in ways in which they can develop um, um, themselves. So I think that's, that's the history. That's, that's what I would take out of your original question. I know we've, we've, I've taken a long winded route there, but all right. yeah. that's, what I would, that's what I would take from, you know, you know the, the UK Black Panther Party, it evolved for a particular reason. Okay. It was very short, it was very brief, but also the same thing with the uh, Black Panther Party, because they did put themselves in the cul-de-sac Okay, yeah. okay. to a point. So it meant that the achievements they made among low, uh, um, low income working class, underclass black people was, was lost. Right. But it was a very good, uh, certainly as an alternative to what uh, Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam were showing, right. it was a very good um, alternative mm -hmm. as to how people uh, can help their neighborhoods. And you don't, you don't have to think um, about uh, oh, I'm doing this as a black person. and for, No, no, it should just be by osmosis. Yeah. Other people, they do it for themselves, but they don't have to call themselves a, a Korean nationalist. Or, right. Uh, or, <laughs> That's uh, true. You, know, you know, they just rely on their family and uh, they rely on a particular work ethic, you know. So well, that's what I would, I, 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 I would say after, after all of that. Develop consciousness, but develop a whole gamut 
of influences. You can't right. evolve and get better if you're just in a very narrow-minded way of viewing what you think your culture is and what is not, uh, you know, part of your culture. That's that's the way I would put it. Okay. And, and uh, well, I always tell people that uh, Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali made me proud to be a black man, but it was working with the Panthers made me proud to be a human being, which eliminated the uh, the single uh, uh, race theory in terms of cooperation and humanism. Uh, but I have to admit that Malcolm X was the beginning for me when I read the autobiography of Malcolm X and then his influence on not only the Panther movement, but people like Stokely Carmichael or Kwame Ture, who I actually had a chance to meet. I, I want you to talk about the legacy of Malcolm X. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Ma Malcolm lived a, a particular life, which I think is also something that people can pick out from, which does not need to kind of uh, be hagiographic and uh, put him on a pedestal uh, of sainthood, right. and neither should it be one that uh, sort of demeans him. I think a lot of people are fairly ignorant about his metamorphosis as an individual. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Muhammad Ali. Yeah. And sometimes it depends on the person's point of view, you That's know, true. That's true. because you, you will see the uh, quote unquote white nationalist of today or white conscious uh, person of today saying, hey, Muhammad Ali said that. Malcolm X said that. Was it? Hang on, that's a particular period in time of their lives that they said that. Right. But Muhammad Ali evolved, you know, from the strictures of uh, the Yaqub thesis of the Nation of Islam to mainstream Sunni Islam, and I think he embraced Sufism, you know, which is a more mystical form of Islam. And the same way Malcolm X evolved from the Nation of Islam, uh, and, and he went into orthodox Sunni Islam, but uh, he was very vocal that he was for black nationalism. So I think looking at uh, Malcolm X, I would say he was inspiring, obviously, in the way he educated himself. Mm -hmm. So first of all, while I wouldn't, I would say the best way is to go through the traditional route of education, mm -hmm. but um, that you can do your, what you can do to properly educate yourself if you want to. Right. There are more facilities for you to do that than Malcolm X had. So right. it's quite extraordinary that he could, you know, develop himself from this, uh, uh, you know, uh, he was a pimp at one time. Uh, he may have exaggerated right. certain things, you know, right. uh, gangsterism and all that, but he did associate with those sort of people. And to elevate himself, we can't sort of dismiss uh, Eli the, the influence of Elijah Muhammad there. The Nation of Islam helped yeah. him. Absolutely. Uh, develop himself although i think the the actual ideology of the nation of islam is very very limited you know if you're not going to grapple with a wide range of knowledge from around the world you can't really develop as a, a person and uh, to help your community but certainly in terms of the way Malcolm X utilized what he uh, um, learned through the nation of islam and what he learned through himself because mm -hmm. he loved reading you know he once said you know if he could just spend all the rest of the time just reading books that's what he would do you know right. um and i think um he he represents so many things he represents uh, uh the achievement of um uh people with a black nationalist mindset in a wider sense in terms of american mythology he represents, yes, a form of Americanism that you can invent yourself. America says you can, so it doesn't matter what color you are, and you can do that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what Malcolm did. And he used, the, and he, a lot of those things he may not have realized that he was also using some African uh, uh, elements there, you know, like Eshu Elegbara, the trickster. Mm -hmm. You know, right, right. Okay. the way he uh, also evolved, he, I think people mentioned uh, that controversial last biography of his, his okay. um, uh, um, Man in Marable, late Man in Marable, I, I think it was. And he was saying the way Malcolm spoke and he represented not because it, it's not like uh, Louis Farrakhan who borrows a lot from the black preacher. Mm -hmm. uh, way of expression, but Malcolm had a, 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 a unique one, which actually you could look at jazz music and 
you know, the way he went through the dance halls, the beat bops, oh, yeah. Yeah. Charlie Absolutely. Parker. And, Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you know, the, also the evolution of jazz. So, so many facets to Malcolm X that you would miss if you didn't know. So it's, I would recommend reading about Malcolm X, black or white, whoever you are, right. uh, as being somebody, he, he, he had his faults. Mm -hmm. uh, probably there were self-destructive elements in there, you know, waving the red flag. Uh, for these people to then come and murder him. But um, yeah, as somebody who cleaned up his life, uh, was somebody for, who passionately, he loved these people, I believe. Uh, yes, you know, I he believe generally did. A lot of our civil rights movement people, you know, they were using their positions, not to help black people, but to enrich their pockets and the, that, that of their families, you know, putting their sons into businesses and uh, into politics. Didn't go too well for some of them, but right. that, that's what that's what they did. Um, it would have been interesting to see, you know, if he'd lived longer, what would have happened. But right. I have, you know, Malcolm X has my respect in, in, in that regard. Oh, okay. Well, you know, he has a very high regard to me. Uh, matter of fact, my name Malik comes from uh, El Haj Malik El Shabazz. So I, I, uh, as I reinvented myself, I reinvented uh, <laughs> my my terms of reference. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. And talk Excellent. to me a little about African political and economic development. Uh, uh, what's your viewpoint on that and, and how it's going now? Well, I think from my perspective, I think Africa tends to be in, in, in a kind of a cul-de-sac. And, um, you know, I write, um, I write about a lot of things, you know, uh, geopolitics, uh, sort of uh, post-Cold War, you know, Russia versus uh, NATO and, and, and that sort of thing. But I do write um, about African history and some of the military rulers who have ruled there. And uh, certainly I have um, sought, particularly I, I wrote a, something on a, a, a Ghanaian head of state. Uh, his name was uh, Ignatius Achampong, came to power in the early 70s. And uh, he was uh, he was relieved of power by through a coup and then uh, 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 he was executed when uh, uh, Rawlins and the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council came to power in 1979. And I used his story to bring up this uh, aspect of African uh, development because I could see that although things went terribly for this man at Champong, I mean, he did, uh, he started off very well mm -hmm. and then ended up badly. And so what I wanted to do by writing about at Champong was to show how he had in his mind what every African ruler should have or leader should have now, which is to make your country politically independent and economically independent. Mm. If you can't do that and you can't industrialize your country, then you're just leaving your country as people who will be just economic slaves. You're just consumers, mm. even though you have vast resources under you in Africa. Uh, you are uh, nonetheless controlled by outsiders who actually are controlling you in a much cheaper way than they did when they were actually they had the responsibility of running your life as colonial masters. Right. And right. So what a champong wanted to do uh, through various policies, which I brought out in this essay, which is a very well read essay actually, um, is um, he wanted. He, he, you know, he, he, he wanted to take on the uh, Bretton Woods, um, the Bretton Woods uh, institutions, the World Bank International Monetary Fund, who do their, you know, whose raison d'etre is not just about development. You know, it really is about keeping countries tied to them normally through debt, because right. that's their raison, you know, the, 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 that's their raison d'etre. You know, right. it's that's, used that's to, really uh, confined Africa, uh, a lot, many places, not just Africa, but also uh, uh, many yes, places in Africa. Yeah, I mean, debt is a reality in the yeah. United States. You know, young people saddled with debt in uh, Europe, uh, the southern European nations, Greece, Portugal, you know, mm -hmm. debt, indebted. Yeah. You know, so the, the, the practices they were using in the so-called third world, they're using <laughs> in other facets today. So uh, that economic development, my thing is, it's not about whether you're a Marxist or a capitalist. At the end of the day, do you have this idea of developing uh, your own 
institutions being politically independent of the old right. colonizers mm -hmm. and also um apart from the political institutions economically taking over the destiny of your of your mineral and natural resources and by natural resources it's also about people right. because the failure of that, that's the biggest investment it could make in human resources but the failure of african leadership in the post so-called independent era is though those desperate africans uh, from sub-saharan africa walking through the sahara desert at the risk of death Right. And that risk doesn't stop until they reach North America, where they go onto these boats, hoping to get into Europe. That is the sad factor yeah. uh, of, um, and shows you the failure of things. Uh, so that's what I would say. That, okay. uh, you, and again, like I was saying, in the context of the Black diaspora, you know, in the context of Africa, you have to kind of change the culture. You have to be self-critical and see well. We know that maybe South Korea had South Korea had um, certain advantages in, in kind of industrializing themselves because the United States helped shield their uh, primary industries, made them develop. You can't do that in today's Africa because of uh, right. you know the GATT world, you know the General Agreement on Trades and Tariffs, where trade is supposed to be free. Right. Uh, you can't do that when, for instance. Um, Kenya, uh, Kenya, uh, Uganda, Rwanda uh, want to develop their cotton industry and their uh, clothes making industry, textile industry. And the moment they want to do that, the US Treasury imposes sanctions on them. You see, because these countries have grown dependent importing used clothes, which in East Africa they call mitumba. Mm. And so when the United States threatened these countries who wanted to, you know, develop their cotton industries and clothes making industries, because to make, you know, clothes making, that's, that's the bedrock of oh, yeah. bringing people out of poverty. That's yeah. what China's done yeah. uh, in recent memory. That's what, uh, you know, Florence did in medieval times. That's what Germany did. So I'm not precluding the fact that ultimately, you know, that you, you, you have to develop further and uh, industrialize yourself in other more sophisticated areas of production, but just for starters. Yeah. And uh, I think, um, so I may be accused of having this sort of, uh, oh, this mentality, you know, but, but it's a real thing right. that the West will hold you down yeah. because the United States was in, threatened, you know, Uganda and all these other countries in East Africa with sanctions because the modern rag pickers in the United States use their lobby to go to uh, the U US Treasury to threaten sanctions. So it's only Rwanda who held firm. Um, and I think that is the ultimate thing that uh, they need to be aware of what the economic system, the global economic system is. And based on that, uh, African leaders need to be aware of how to um, uh, to, to, to they have to think about how are they going to uh, raise the vast amounts of people out of poverty and how are you going to develop an independent economic uh, 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 political system. And that's what when I even when I'm writing at the past, because I don't just look at history as being about just reading uh, in the past and it's all uh, dead paper and whatever. No, no, the past affects us. It affects the present, it affects the future. Right. And so, as I said with this, uh, uh, for example, the essay I wrote about uh, Colonel Achampong, I was trying to bring out what he tried to achieve. And he, he, he did a bit before things went totally haywire, which was, that's a whole, it's a whole different story. Right. Okay. But, uh, a longer story, but um, yeah. Okay. And also, uh, in that regard, uh, in terms of your, your fabulous articles, please tell people about your website, uh, you know, because that's why I love to go get uh, and read your articles, not just the YouTube channel, but tell us about your website where uh, people can read uh, your writings. Well, you can go to uh, Adeyinka Makinde blog. So um, if you just uh, search for my name under any um, search, um, uh, any search engine, um, just tap in my name, Ade Yinka Makinde, and blog, 
and then you 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 see all my writing there. Okay. Um, it's kind of varied, uh, but uh, yeah, you, you you take what you you take what you like from it. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right. And this may be a, a relic of my uh, attached past, especially with Osajifu Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, but I always uh, love the study of the period when they were trying to organize the uh, United States of Africa and the meetings in uh, Addis Ababa. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, that in terms of uh, as an ideology and how practical, practical or un impractical it is. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, when African states were becoming independent in the post-World War period, uh, Ghana was first in Black Africa, you know, 90. 1957, right. uh, but things really took off in the you know, early 1960s, 1960 itself. And so the idea was they wanted to form a, a block, a block that would uh, ensure economic cooperation and um, uh, political um, unity of some sort. And so you had uh, one block was known as the Monrovia block, and the other one was the Casablanca block. Right. And so the I think the uh, uh, was it the Monrovia people were the ones who were kind of conservative said, look, let's right. get uh, things integrated gradually. Right, right. So they right. felt they were being pragmatic. But the other group, which Kwame Nkrumah belonged to, mm -hmm. I think the Casablanca group, they, they were the ones who wanted African integration as soon as possible. Pan-Africanists. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and that included people like Ben Bella yeah. and um, yes. Yes. Gamal Abdel Nasser. Mm -hmm. So even though he was uh, obviously fixated himself on Arab unity, but uh, I think Nasser is a very interesting man to study. Mm -hmm. And of course, Ma Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali both met, met him on their journeys uh, there. I think he's a fascinating man. Uh, and, and, you know, bl Blacks and Arabs have a kind of a history, a painful history of slavery, even longer than with Europeans, uh, yeah. with the transatlantic slave. But if you look at Nasser, what he tried to do, the, the way, for instance, uh, he rescued the family, you know, the children of Patrice Lumumba uh, yes. in the Congo before, you know, when Lumumba was eventually caught by his enemies and, and executed. Um, I think that's a, he's a good way of person in terms of looking at um, how Arab unity, Arab and uh, black African unity can uh, progress. But yeah, uh, and I think with, with, with those two things in mind, I think people felt uh, uh, Nkrumah was going too far. He was going too fast. He was interested in himself in other things that, uh, and not concentrated on Ghana, because you know? when he was overthrown, he was on the way to a quote unquote peace mission in uh, China? Vietnam. Oh, yeah. Vietnam, that's right. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. ultimately Vietnam, but he made a lot of stops on the way. He stopped in Egypt to meet Nasser. He stopped in uh, India to meet uh, Mrs. Gandhi. And he stopped in uh, China. I think uh, Xu Enlai was there at the time, which uh, who Huey Hugh, Newton actually met at one point. That's right. And then before he could go on, uh, you know, he, he, he was overthrown. So in a sense, yeah, I think um, in, in some ways, what he did may look unrealistic, but I think with you, you don't have to share Kwame Nkrumah's left-leaning views. Uh, I, I, he was a Pan-Africanist at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And I think his ideas can be evolved and used as the bedrock of development in, in today's world, because um, he was for independence. Mm -hmm. He was for industrialization, you know, the Volta uh, Dam project. And I think with all the problems in Africa with uh, ethnic squabbles and religious squabbles, I think the, the best way of development is not by breaking up into smaller polities, mm -hmm. it's by developing as large polities as possible. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, I know from the fact that what is happening in Nigeria today, mm -hmm. uh, so bad is the security situation, and so bad is the worsening relations between different ethnic and religious groups. Uh, a lot of them want to do what the Igbos wanted to do in the 1960s and break Nigeria up and secede. Mm. And I'm saying I can't stop that because of the terrible leadership we have. Mm. The same is happening in Ethiopia, you know, which seems to be like a, a, a revenge operation against the Tigrayans. Uh, 
because their leaders had ruled uh, um, Tigray since they overthrew Mengistu mm -hmm. in the early 1990s. Uh, you know, it, it, when you start these wars, that you know, the bitterness, the enmity, it's difficult to reconcile. Mm, yeah. So I would just say, still say at the back of their mind, and why Kwame Nkrumah is still relevant. Yes. Even though you may think certain things he did, he didn't do it the right way. You may feel also he may have been unrealistic in terms of the dates of projection, but he's very right about uh, the idea that uh, if you can cooperate among a larger, as large a land mass as possible, mm -hmm. yeah? yeah, you can find unity in doing that. Get rid, rid of the suspicions of tribe and tongue, ethnicity and religion. That's the best way Africa can develop. Because at the end of the day, he was proved right in the sense that <laughs> even though they formed the Organization of African Unity, the French uh, Francophone speaking people were more integrated into France than they <laughs> were true. in Africa. That's true. The Anglophone countries, the, the ones who were colonized by Britain, you know, they themselves, they were, they were uh, um, largely integrated into the British Commonwealth uh, economic system. So, uh, it, and that's no good. That's right. no good. You're serving for the most part somebody else. When in fact, if the ultimate idea is that Africa must industrialize, mm. become independent. Um, it would be best to do that with a large polity. Okay. And this is where Kwame Nkrumah was right, and I think still remains right to this day. It's okay. just the way about going about it. We need to look at Nkrumah and see where he went wrong about it. Okay. It may look as if he uh, took on the, the uh, underpinnings of an authoritarian ruler, you know, uh, look at the newspapers. Uh, oh, the Nkrumah, um, the, the, the young Nkrumahites, you know, who formed this sort of militia and they would have to sing this anthem. And it looks as if, wow, this man is overcome by his power. Mm. He's become a dictator. I can see why people think that way. And he should have done things differently. Right. But look at the positive thing. What he was trying to do was to create nationhood. Yes, what absolutely. he was trying to do was to create people who would be loyal to each other. Mm. Unfortunately, it came out looking as if he was indoctrinating people and, you know, and, 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 and the reason for that was for his own personal prestige. Wow. Wow. I think that's what people need to pick uh, out from Nkrumah. So I'm not somebody who will say Nkrumah never dies, uh, you know, in, or Nkrumah is never wrong. Um, I wouldn't go that far but I would still say he is still a very, very relevant person wow. that people can need to look at in terms of uh, the way, what he wanted to achieve for Ghana and for Africa, and then build up on that. Right. Uh, Just moving forward, basically. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. Based, yes. Yeah, yeah. Gaining economic independence, because mm -hmm. this uh, leader I was telling you about, uh, Colonel Achampong, mm -hmm. that, uh, he, 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 I believe he was an incriminate in, in a sense. Right. And, uh, but it was, but whatever you are, whether you're a lazy fair person, whether you're a, a, a socialist, do you want to industrialize? Do you want to become economically independent and not keep Africa as a consumer society? Right. Yeah. Okay. If you, if you want to do those things, go back and learn about Kwame Nkrumah, see where he made his mistakes but look at him in, in, in a general sense and um, think about the ideas that can be used to develop upon what he said. Okay. Yeah, I, I had the pleasure of being in uh, Accra, Ghana, and I bought a book called Forward Ever uh, by uh, Osajifu Kwame Nkrumah, which was a small but very impactful book. So you just laid the whole book out right there. <laughs> And final two questions. Uh, what are your future plans and projects? Wow. Um, as I said, I think I really need to um, be very serious about getting those projects off the ground based on my books. Jersey Boy and, uh, yeah. uh, you know, Dick Tiger. I, I really have to because it's kind of waxed and waned over the time. And I have in had interest. Okay. What I've seen, I've said, look, either people haven't been able to deliver 
oh, I've said, look, that is just not a good deal, please. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I can't keep on saying that, oh, you know, uh, what's his name? Um, John Houston, the famous director, you know, it took him like over 20 years to make The Man Who Would Be King, you know, right. which he made with Sean Connery and uh, Michael Caine in 1975. He'd originally wanted to make it with, uh, was it Spencer Tracer? Oh, Sorry, okay. Spencer Tracy and... Um, uh, was it Humphrey Bogart? And um, so these things can take a long time. Okay. Um, but it's um, yeah, that's something I would definitely want to do. Okay. And maybe kind of formalize my history um, and you know my history video channel and my writing. You know, kind of synthesize that into something, not okay. into a vainglorious thing. But I think okay. we're talking here about ideas and movements. True. And I think, you know, if one can, yeah, it makes it easier for people to understand what you're about, because I write about a whole range of things, you know, uh, which has got interest, you know, from people who are police chiefs in uh, California. Oh, wow. Okay. Love what I did with Jersey Boy or okay. famous Hollywood actor, four time nominated, one time Oscar winner. He loved that essay I wrote about Solzhenitsyn, uh, you know, mm. you know, and I think, um, I think if I can just coalesce things, uh, that would what I, be what I'd want to work through. I can work through the internet, which gives us uh, quite a lot of opportunities. Oh, it does. I'm aware, yeah, yeah, I'm aware of, you know, the censorship, you know, the way they try and uh, uh, get rid of people whose views they don't uh, like. Right. Um, but yeah, that's uh, certainly uh, what I would want to do for the future. Maybe have a formal channel, do something like what you're doing. Oh, okay. Yeah, that'd be out outstanding. Now, you know, yeah, I can bring <laughs> people on to discuss uh, a whole range of uh, issues, you know. Um, you just so make yeah, sure those, you those schedule things. me as a guest, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Down the road a little yeah. bit. <laughs> yeah, sometime, of course. No, and, absolutely. And my final question is, how can people uh, follow you on social media and, again, give them uh, all the information where to look for your writings as well as, uh, you know, uh, your uh, vlogs, as they say? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm on social media, so I have a Facebook page. Uh, that's an official one okay. uh, or, you know, a public one. Yeah. Okay. And then um, I'm on Twitter. Uh, and uh, also I have this blog at the Yinka Mackinday, uh, blog spot. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, you do a search and you, you'll definitely find me. Okay. Can't miss me. Okay. Well, it's been a <laughs> brother. I, I really appreciate you. I know you so busy right there in London and I just appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor myself. Yes. Uh, and, uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, I would definitely uh, love to uh, see if we can bring you over here at some point uh, once the pandemic uh, subsides. Uh, certainly, we're gonna. I'm gonna jump back on a plane over there to uh, see you in London and uh, uh, look forward to uh, you know many things you have going on as well as uh, collaborate maybe on some things as well. So sure. uh, uh, yeah, again, thank you so much, brother. Yeah, thank you, brother Malik. Okay, my brother, well, look, take care, and I'll uh, talk to you real soon. Okay, then. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother. Bye now. Bye-bye.